All right, so let's talk about curb roasting. Um, what is curb roasting? Well, it's an attack path that attackers have used for years at this point um, to great success. It was first discovered in 2014 by a fellow named Tim Medine. Tim found out that within Active Directory environments, there's a specific configuration that can be set up that allows any single user who's authenticated to potentially gain access to other accounts within the environment. Why does this matter? Well, typically these accounts that are configured um, for this specific setting, which we'll get into, that allows this attack path to even exist, well, they happen to very commonly also be given um, elevated access, right? So a attacker who's compromised a workstation and performs this attack, gains access to another account, well, typically that other account is going to have privileges that are outside what they already possess, right? So um, even sometimes things like domain administrator access, which obviously if you're a ransomware operator is highly valuable. Um, sounds scary, probably is scary. It's crazy because this attack, like I said, um, you know, it's eight years old and it's still to this day is very prevalent. So let's talk a little bit about how it works and more importantly, how you can protect yourself from it if you're running AD. So uh, how does curb roasting work? Um, the first concept that uh, plays a part in curb roasting is what's called a service principle name or an SPN for short. A service principle name is a unique identifier for a service that's used for Kerberos authentication. And it essentially ties um, hosts and services to identities. So it allows the domain controller to properly issue tickets for services that are used by um, users in the, within a, a network environment. Um, Without going too much into the beast that is curb roast, um, all that really matters for the purposes of curb roasting is like whether or not an SPN is set. So if it's set on a user account, what an attacker can do is request what's called a service ticket from the domain controller for that service that is tied to that account. So that's a long sentence. Why does that matter? Well, the cool thing is that the service ticket's actually encrypted. So it's an encrypted blob that is uses the um, service accounts hashed password um, to encrypt the ticket. So maybe you're putting the dots together here. Um, that allows an attacker to take that requested ticket from the domain controller for a user that has an SPN and try to crack it because the same logic can be applied in reverse, right? Um, by simply guessing different password iterations um, and encrypting them just like the domain controller does. Um, eventually, if you have a match, well, then you have the password for that account. So this is really great for attackers because let's say there is a service account. It has a very weak password set. You request a ticket for that service account. You crack it. You can now authenticate as the account and access alternate resources. Um, like I said during the intro, this has a wide range of um, applicability for attackers. Sometimes it matters a lot. Sometimes it does not matter as much as you would think. But let's go ahead and show you within an actual terminal the steps that an attacker could potentially take to execute this attack. And then we'll demonstrate a little bit more some of the implications that could be experienced um, should you find this within an environment. Okay, so I've hopped over to my terminal. We are now officially an attacker. So go ahead and put your red hat on, um, put on your hoodie. We are now within a network and we are attacking an environment. Um, what we're going to do is we're gonna perform the initial step that we outlined in our diagram, which is querying the domain controller, looking for accounts that have SP and set, and trying to request those service tickets that we can crack. To do that, we're going to use a tool set called getuserspns.py. This is a part of the mpacket library, if you're familiar with it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this tool set to request those tickets, and we wanna write any tickets we get to a file called encrypted, if I could type encrypted sts. And we will also give it the IP address of the domain controller that we're targeting. 
as well as the credentials that we're going to use to authenticate. So like I said, this is an attack that occurs after an adversary will um, achieve initial access within an environment. This is in playbooks that are used by actual ransomware groups. And it's super common for this to be a normal kind of checklist step, right? So maybe they'll get access through phishing or password spraying, or maybe they'll buy access from an access broker. They'll hop into an environment, and this is a step that they're going to perform through various means to try to get more widespread access um, to alternate accounts and then laterally move and whatever they need to do throughout an environment. So what we can do here is pretend that our Bob user, his credentials one way or another were compromised, right? So maybe he had a um, piece of malware run on his computer. Maybe he was phished and then they authenticated to like a VPN solution as him. Um, all you need to know is that the attacker is now Bob. And what we will do when we run this command is you'll see quite a bit of output, but what matters is that this account called SVC Backup, and I apologize, the, the text was kind of wrapped uh, poorly. This account has an SPN set, and what that allowed us to do is request a service ticket for that account. So if you look at our directory, that file that we specified up here now exists and it's called encrypted underscore STs, just like we said. If we take a look at it, it looks like a bunch of gibberish because it's a, an encrypted blob. You can maybe make out some information up here. But what we can do now is re actually crack this using um, a tool set called John. Um, you can also use a tool set commonly called Hashcat. But in our case, this will work just fine. And after a short period of time, again, for demonstration purposes, it's a fairly weak password. Um, we have the clear text password for the SVC backup account. So a lot happened right there, but just to recap, we originally were just the Bob user, right? We requested a service ticket for the SVC backup account. We got an encrypted blob. We cracked it with a tool set, and now we can authenticate as the SVC backup account. Okay, so we have the credentials now for SVC underscore backup. It's an account. We don't know much about it, but let's find out why that attack path matters. So we were Bob. Now let's try to go ahead and figure out how to authenticate to a host with those new credentials. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use a tool set called Crack Map Exec that essentially uh, lets you authenticate to hosts um, and also perform a lot of other cool stuff that we don't have time to get into today. And what I'll do is I'll give it the credentials for the SVC backup account that we cracked earlier. So we have the password, which we gathered in a previous step. And if we press enter here, it will authenticate us to the host. You can see from the flag right here, this actually means that we have admin access. So this SVC backup account, for whatever reason, maybe it's some configuration that's um, needed for a business function. Well, it has direct admin access to the domain controller. What's great about that for, for us, since we're an attacker, is we can go ahead and use an additional tool set called wmiexec.py and we can go ahead and just get a shell on the domain controller directly. And after a short period of time, a shell is popped and we can execute commands on the remote host, which happens to be the domain controller in this environment. And just like that, you can see how quickly after an initial compromise, Kerberos and can be used to laterally move and acquire more credentials um, within an environment. So that's the attack. It's uh, pretty simple, pretty quick, but let's talk about the important part, which is protecting yourself from it if it's something that you've encountered, or especially if you're running Active Directory and you just really are curious. Um, first and foremost, the Remediation step that will always be recommended, I think, 
across any firm is passwords. The the solution um, that is you know the most beneficial and the easiest to implement will always win. And in this case, that's passwords, right? So even if an attacker can request that service ticket, they still have to crack the password for it to be useful. So whenever we encounter this within environments, we recommend for these accounts that have SPN set, passwords of 25 characters or more um, are extremely recommended. If that's not feasible, something that's highly complex and as long as you can possibly swing um, will greatly assist in mitigating this attack. So secondary to passwords and a little bit more difficult to actually go and uh, pursue would be just auditing the service principal names on the accounts themselves. So um, depending on the size of the environment you're working with, this could be you know very difficult. Um, it's also important to delineate between service principal names that are set on user accounts and those that are set on computer accounts. Um, any Active Directory environment is going to ship with a handful of service principal names. The difference is they're usually set only on computer objects. And computer objects have a um, complex random password that's actually regularly rotated every 30 days. So it's not really an attack path for it and in the attackers. So just keep that in mind. If it is something you pursue in addition to password management and, um, you know, uh, the initial remediation step that is setting a complex password for accounts that have an SPN set. Um, yeah, just keep it in mind that um, there are default SPNs that um, you definitely do not want to remove. <laughs> um, but that is also something that you can pursue for remediation sake. So lastly, um, on the topic of detection and response, something that is heavily beneficial within environments uh, is setting up what's called a honeypot SPN, or some people call it a honeypot service account. And basically this is a fake um, service principal name that you set on an account that um, either doesn't actually exist or um, maybe doesn't actually is disabled or doesn't actually have a uh, any access to anything. And what you can do is you can um, configure monitoring rules for that account. Since it's not actually used for anything, um, no user is going to need to request a service ticket um, for it, right? So that is a really, really useful indicator of compromise, right? Because if you see an alert for a request for a service ticket for that account, there is a very large chance that something fishy is going on within your environment um, since it is such a common attack. Um, the reason that it works is adversaries will commonly just query like an entire domain for any single account like we just did, right? Um, that possesses an SPN. So um, if their OPSEC is not super good, that could be a way that you could kind of get a tip off of a, an active event. So would recommend that as well. But again, back to the passwords, um, <laughs> I can't emphasize enough uh, just how much that will mitigate a lot of these attacks, especially if they're SPNs that are business critical and cannot be removed and actually are, are needed for, for business use cases. So with that, that wraps up the curb roasting breakdown, short and sweet, um, not too deep into the technical details of, of curb roast, which is, um, yeah, quite a handful, but hopefully that's beneficial. And uh, if you have any questions on further remediation guidance or maybe something that's unique to your environment, feel free to contact us at Risk360 and we'll be happy to help.